you got your Bibles today, we're going to be in Romans, the 15th chapter, only going to try to cover about seven verses. There's a whole lot there. Many years ago, many years ago, long before there were cell phones, things like that, there was a young boy. And this young boy was out trying to pay his way through schooling. And he was going door to door selling the household goods. He'd been working hard all morning. It started about seven o'clock, just looking for signs of life in different houses, knocking on doors, trying to sell his wares. And he was getting pretty darn hungry. He reached in his pocket. He only had a dime left. That would buy, that would buy some food, not a lot, but some. You used to be able to have a meal for a dime. And he thought, you know, I got a dime. I think the next house I come to, I'm going to ask them if they would give me a meal. And so he's got his nerve up. He's going to ask some strangers for a meal. He knocks on the door. He steps back. And a very attractive young lady comes to the door. That kind of rattled him a little bit. He thought, I'm not going to ask her for a meal. I'm going to ask her just for a glass of water. And he said, ma'am, could you possibly give me a glass of water? And she says, yeah. And she looked at him. She said, come on in. He stepped inside the house back in the days when you could safely let strangers in. And he stepped inside the house. She went to the kitchen. She came back with a great big, huge glass of milk. She thought he's probably hungry. She gave him the milk. He just slammed it down. He was thirsty. He was hungry. And he looked at her and said, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate it. How much do I owe you? And she looked at him and stepped back and said, our mother taught us not to ever let people pay for a kindness that we offered to them. You don't owe me anything. He said, well, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Not only did it strengthen my body, it's actually helped my faith in God because you were so kind to me. Well, he went about the rest of his day. She went on with her life. Many, 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 many years passed by. After she got married, she had some kids, sent the kids away. She discovered she wasn't feeling well. She went to the doctor. He said, mm, not good. You've got a very rare disease. And we don't know exactly what to do. We're not even sure of our diagnosis. We're going to have to send you to the big city, to the big hospital. They do research there, get you some better help. She went to that hospital. She had a consultation scheduled and in walks the doctor it was Dr. Howard Kelly the young boy she'd given a glass of milk to while he was working his way through his schooling he recognized her he looked at her he said we're going to get you well he made a commitment he was going to do everything in his power to get her well it was a long difficult haul they worked together and he finally got her healed and cured. We never know what small acts of kindness will do in the long run. Today, as we look in Romans, we've got this juxtaposition of the strong and the weak in the church. And Paul comes down and he's talking to the strong people. That would be you. I know who you are. You're the strong ones. You're not the weak ones. And he gives us three things we need to do to help the weaker ones. He tells us that we need to bear with them. And we need to build them up. And we even need to go so far as to bond with them. So we're going to look at the scripture and we'll see if we can make some sense out of it today. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. Now keep in mind, here in this Roman church, it's a hodgepodge. Paul has never been there. He writes this letter based on what he's heard about the struggles they have. Now, keep in mind the kind of church it is. You've got people who've come out of Judaism. They know the law. They know the Bible. They've studied it all their lives. So they have a foundation and a background. They have a lot of knowledge. They need more love for the weak ones. The weak ones have come out of abject paganism. These are the people that had multiple gods. They had lots of wine fest where they would get rip roaring to wine drunk, then that would usually lead to a great big huge orgy with whoever was there. It was wild times. So you've got these educated people who know about the ways of God. You've got these who don't. And he's been talking to us for a while now in Romans about the strong and the weak and how much God wants us to get together. 
I think looking at this crowd of people today, you are the strong one. So this is a message for you. And there will be great benefits for you, as always, when you do God's work, God's ways, with God's attitude. So in Romans chapter 15, verse 1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Together, you may with one voice glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Well, that's a tough assignment. That's a lot to do. We don't usually by nature like to bear with the failings and the weaknesses of others. It's a challenge. Verse one, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Last week, we got some pretty clear instruction about we needed to love them and not judge them. We got some pretty clear instruction that we need to create peace rather than conflict. And we got some pretty clear instruction that we need to live out of faith rather than out of sin. And Paul went on to say anything that's not of faith is sin. And now he comes along and says, you're going to have to bear with these weak ones. You're going to have to build them up. You're going to have to bond with them. You're going to have to help them. You're going to have to do it the way Christ has done with you. You look at Jesus, that ragtag group of disciples he chose. You know, if I'd been him, I would have chosen the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the only group of people that he was never harsh with. They were the strong ones. They were the smart ones. They were the educated ones, but they were the legalistic, self-righteous ones, too. I would have chose them. He got the fishermen, the tax collectors, just a rambunctious bunch of people. And when he got those people together, he often said, oh, you of little faith, but he was bearing with them. He knew they were going to have a massive failure when he went to the cross, and he continued to love them to build them up, to bond with them. And it worked out pretty good because those 11 disciples that he left everything with, we got to scratch Judas off that list. He was replaced by the apostle Paul. Those people changed this world forever and ever. So God's got a plan. We don't always see it. It's not always fun, but he said, it's not for you to please yourself. Like Jesus came. I'm amazed at Jesus. I really am. He left the riches of heaven and became poor so that we might become rich. I can't imagine God lowering himself. Let's put this in simple context. It's like you choosing to become a worm to help the other worms. You probably don't want to do that, do you? Yeah, I, I, there's, there's something wrong with me. But after we've had in the summertime a hard rain, all the earth ones come out of my flower beds and they'll get out on the concrete. Then the sun comes out and they start to fry out there. I always I'll go out and I'll find some of them are just like fried like a potato chip. But if I can catch them shortly after while the, the concrete is still wet, I'll try to help them. And I'll pick them up to put them back in the flower bed, and they freak out. Have you ever seen a worm freak out? It just wiggles crazily. And I'll get them back in the flower bed. For me to communicate with a worm is difficult. For God to communicate with me is more difficult. He's so much bigger. It's like if we became worms to save the worms... Number one, I don't know that they're even worth saving 
I use them as fish bait, but that's a sudden death for sure. I'm either going to drown them or a fish is going to throw them. They don't have a chance. But he did so much for us. And that's why we have the obligation to do for others what has been done for us. So last week, we talked a lot about judgment. People are usually interested in judgment. It's a tough concept. It's one of the most hardest theological concepts I ever had to wrap my head around of figuring out the law of judgment. In Romans 2, 1, it's real clear. You practice what you judge others for. If you want to condemn yourself to doing something you don't like, just keep judging those people that do it. You will. It's a law. It's a spiritual law. It holds true. And I look back at so many people I have judged over my lifetime and judged poorly. I'll tell you a story about a guy named Phil Bennett. Years ago, in 1975, the summer, I got to run the sound at Glorietta Baptist Conference Center. We had 2,500 happy, excited, good Christian people come in there every week. New crowd every single week. We'd run about 12 weeks throughout the summer. And I got to run the sound. That meant I get to know everybody who's on the platform, the best preachers, the best worship leaders, the best soloists, the best of the best. I was in meetings with them. We worked together morning, noon, and night. That whole summer, I probably took it off two and a half days. Busy, 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 did a great job. Nobody looking over my shoulder. I got the job done, and I love being unsupervised. Imagine that. The second summer, the big boss comes around. He says, hey, I need to meet you tomorrow. I'm going to introduce you to your boss. I'm thinking, oh, I don't want a new boss. But he'd hired a new boss. And I wasn't really excited about the whole idea. By the second summer, it was the summer of 76, I had graduated from college. And you know, we know everything about the time we get out of college. We are so wise. We have finished all of our learning for our lifetime. So I'm Joe College. He knows everything. The big boss comes around. He's got this guy with him. He's got on a dumpy looking sweater. He's slouching. He's got a ruddy complexion, disheveled hair. His glasses are crooked. And he talks real slow and deep. And I'm thinking, oh, what turnip truck did this country bumpkin fall off of? And I'm trying to make nice because he is my boss. I'm going to have to deal with him. Probably going to have to manage up all summer. And I'm just not really excited about it. Well, he was a nice guy. I didn't think he was very sharp. Went to a meeting the next day. And he said, well, I've heard that you did a good job last summer, about nearly that slow. And I'm just thinking, like, let's, I got things to do. Let's wrap this up. He said, you did a good job last summer. I'm not going to interfere with your job and your work over there. And you're never going to surprise me. And he said it with a kind of authority. I thought, this is interesting. He said, let me tell you a story. He said, once upon a time, there was a country farmer and his wife. They were hardworking people. And the highlight of their life was on Saturdays, they hitched the mule, the plow mule up to the wagon, go to town, load their wagon up with supplies for the coming week. And that was the highlight of their life because they'd stop at the cafe and have a meal together in town. They always look forward to this. One day they're going to town. And they've hitched up the mule to the wagon. They're on their way to town. They're about halfway there, and the mule just stops. He gets his whip, gets the mule, whips the reins. The mule just won't go. Has to get crawl down from the wagon, gets the whip, takes the hard end of it, the stick end of it, pounds the mule inside of the head, and said, come on, mule, that's one. Got the mule going again, gets back. They go down the road. Everything is fine. And then the mule just stops. Tries the whip, shakes the reins, won't do anything, gets his whip out, goes down, hits the mule again a couple times and said, mule, let's go. We're going to town. We're going to go. You're not going to stop anymore. That's two. It happens a third time. He gets down. He didn't grab the whip this time. He gets his rifle. He stands in front of the mule. He puts the barrel right between its eyes, pulls the trigger, drops the mule to the ground dead. His wife looks at him and said, why did you kill the mule? He said, that's one. When he told me that story, I thought, you know, this is a guy probably not to be messed with. 
The next question, he said, what day of the week would you like to be your day off? And I said, oh, last summer I took two and a half days off. I was doing sound. I got four times as much responsibility this summer. Now I'm in charge of sound and lights and setups and the auditorium and all of this. I said, I, I really can't take a day off. Well, I know every, you know how wise you are right after you graduate. I'm thinking this guy just didn't get it. He doesn't understand. He said, then he asked me another question. Would you like to choose your day off? Would you like for me to choose one for you? It's your choice. He kind of looked at me like that's one. And I thought, um, how about Sunday? Let's do Sunday. What I didn't know, this was the first human being that had ever been divorced and graduated from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He had a 4.0 grade point average. After he finished seminary, he went to the military, went to the Navy. He was in naval intelligence. He was in the Vietnam War. The Viet Cong had put a $20,000 price tag on his head. Anybody who killed him, they would give $20,000 U.S. dollars to. That was a lot of money in times of war in Vietnam. They had to pull him out because he was always ahead of the enemy. He was phenomenal. I finally figured out after about the first meeting with him that I'm the weaker, he's the stronger, and he did exactly this. He always was bearing with me. He had to put up with me. This hot young swift whiffer snapper that thinks he knows everything because he did a good job last summer. Learned so much from that guy because he was constantly building me up. He was constantly passing on compliments from the crew, from the guests who'd been there, from the conference leaders. And he became a real friend. Phil's about 82 years old now. He finally came home from Hong Kong, the last mission he was on. In his late 70s, he went over there. He got the church attendance in an English-speaking church up over 500 and built a new multi-story, beautiful downtown educational building while he was there. He's a superstar. He's always been. I judged him. I thought he didn't know anything. I thought he was stupid. Those things all have come back on me many times over, and it just helped me realize so many times I don't have a clue who somebody really is. That's one of the reasons God says don't judge. So we've got to bear with the weaker brothers. Don't judge them. Bear with them. Keep loving them. The next thing he talks about here is after bearing with them, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. I've got a mentor that I work with at Glorietta. He's been a mentor for 47 years now. I've never known anybody with the people skills he has. And he's told me along the way, we're people builders. That's what we do. We help people become better. And he's always given me freedom to ask him. I used to ask him, I said, why? I'd go to Nashville to the Sunday school board, spend a little bit of time there with him. We'd go to lunch. We'd get to the Hyatt, which had a real good lunch buffet. He always took me somewhere I could get a lot of food fast. Made me real happy. We'd go to the Hyatt for lunch, and he's visiting with all the valet parkers, and he knows them all by name. I just asked him one day, because he gave me that freedom. I said, why do you mess with these valet parkers? They're nobodies. He said, well, because they're becoming somebodies. And I enjoy helping young people. And I like to catch them when they're young, become friends with them, win their trust. And when they get in trouble, they've got somebody they can come to for advice. And I can teach them the ways of God. Well, I remember when one of those valet Parker, I was back about three years later, he'd become the manager of that restaurant. Well, guess what? When we get there, the line's out of the door and they see my mentor at the back of the line, he was about 6'3", so you could easily see him. This valet park had become the manager of the restaurant. He'd see him and just wave him up to the front of the line and give him the best table in the place. That same young man got promoted from managing that restaurant to managing all the restaurants at the height at DFW. 
So anytime he was flying through DFW, he could always go and have a great meal at the best table without ever waiting in line with his friend who'd been a valet parker and a restaurant manager. And then this guy got promoted to the whole height in San Diego Bay. So when he'd go out there, guess who got to stay in the penthouse for the lowest hotel rates they had every time? He taught me about looking beyond what somebody appears to be to what they could be. And that's kind of where my life is going. It's so fulfilling. It requires patience, which I'm usually short on, to bear with these people. But then when you start to build them up, there's probably nothing on the planet that's more valuable than helping other people improve their lives. You do that as parents. You do that as spouses. You do that as workers. You have opportunities all day long. And Christ is just pointing it out for us through the scriptures today. Years ago, I got to go to the first conference that Dr. Phil did when he came out with his first book. And it was about relationships. And I went with my girlfriend to this thing. His father had started Pathways, and they got all the Pathways people to come and kind of be the workers there they had on the red shirts. There were about a 1,000 people there. So he starts us out. He divides us up with our partners. And he said, I want you to move the chairs around, put your chairs facing each other and put your knees touching. I want you close to each other. So we did that. Then he said, I want you to look at your partner, take turns and tell them three things that they do that you really, really love. You're so grateful. That's why you stay with them, because they do these three things that mean so much to you. And so we started telling each other what we're doing that contributed to the relationship. That was a happy time. And then he said, I'd like for you to look at your partner and tell them three things they do that contaminate the relationship. Man, that's when the crew started scrambling to bring cases of tissues out. The tears started to flow. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some of these people had the first opportunity they ever had in their life to say, I don't like this and this and this. It really is bad for me. It crushes me every time you do this. I wish you'd stop. They never really had a context to say that. And they did. Other people heard things they had no idea they were doing that was damaging their partner. And Dr. Phil wrapped it up by saying, everything you do in a relationship is either going to contribute to it or it's going to contaminate it. He said, be sure that you're a contributor. So this is where we start building people up. You're either building people up or you're breaking them down. I have eliminated the negative people in my life, unless they're really young and really having to bear with them. I just don't tolerate it. It's destructive. In the tongue is the power of life and death. All of us need to surround ourselves with people that will contribute to us, that will build us up. And as we learn from them, then we can begin to build others up with the things we've learned from them. The scripture goes on here. He keeps talking. For Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. I don't want you to miss this. Instructions, the things written of old, like the Old Testament and Psalms and Proverbs, and then the New Testament. Those are the things that were written before we got here. Those things of old, they're to instruct us that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. God's trying to show us how we can have hope. We need hope to keep on keeping on. If we lose our hope, that's when the gun goes to the head and we check out. I've watched that. Helplessness leads to hopelessness. This is why so many times we've talked about this continuum we all live on. On one extreme end is a victim. 
it's not my fault. Somebody did it to me. There was absolutely nothing I could do about it. When people take that perspective of being a victim, it leads to helplessness. There's nothing I can do. I hate helplessness. It's a bad, bad, bad feeling to me. So some people live on this end. Other people live on the extreme end, and they take 100% responsibility for everything that comes into their life. Because of the law of reciprocity, we reap what we sow. Because of the law of attraction, we're constantly attracting things. We attract good things. We attract bad things. But it's based on really what we're doing. We become magnets for different things of different frequencies. And we're all on this continuum somewhere. I've lived on this one. In my first marriage, we went to eight different counselors. Everyone would say he did everything we asked him to 100% of the time, always. She would do about 90% and then about 70% and then about 50% and this isn't doing any good and I'm not going back. Well, bless my little heart. I said, we went to eight different counselors and they all said I did everything perfectly. I chose the victim role. I thought there's nothing I can do about that. And that was not true. I was good at counseling. I could give all the right answers. I could do all the assignments. I wasn't trying to make the relationship better. I was trying to win because that's all I know. know. You can run out the door. I'm bad. I really am. I know that. But I thought in every time there's a conflict, you're either going to win or lose. I didn't know there were other options at the time because I graduated from college. I knew everything. They hadn't taught me that. So it's if I'm either going to win or lose, I'd rather win than lose. So I was about winning rather than resolving big, big difference. This felt bad. This led to helplessness. Helplessness leads to hopelessness. I live on the other extreme. Some people say you're crazy. It's not true. It's no way. But I'll take 100% of everything. You know, like the way the election turned out? Blame me. It's my fault. I will take responsibility for that. When the stock market crashed in 2008, I did that. And by the way, I started the China virus and brought the pandemic to the United States. I'll take full responsibility for that. Well, that's an extreme thing. But I, when I take responsibility, it means I'm not helpless. And that's not going to lead me to hopeless. I've been close to totally hopeless. Some of you have too. Where the pain is so much greater than the pleasure. You think it'd just be better not to be alive anymore. Been there, done that. This is about how God is trying to give us hope. Encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. He's given you a way of hope. He's trying to show you because he's the God of endurance and encouragement. Some of you are tired. Some of you weary. Some of you are exhausted from just trying to raise children for all these many years. And you're just running low on endurance. You're tired. Some of you have been in challenging life situations. Some of you have been short on money for a long time. You've got a lot of different things that are wearing down your endurance. The God of endurance wants to help you keep on keeping on. He wants to encourage you. He wants to take you out of fear and put you back into courage. And he's trying to tell you this is one of the ways you do it. Even though it doesn't appear that it's to please yourself, when you bear with these weaker ones, when you build them up, when you bond with them, God's going to see you're obeying him and he's going to go ahead of you and he's going to bless you for your obedience. He's going to bless you because you're doing things his way. He always wants the absolute best for you. Always, that's the nature of our God. And he tells us this is how you go about it. He's trying to make that happen for us. He wants us living in harmony. Do you realize in Psalm 133, it's a very rare situation where God 
commands his blessing. When brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, God commands the blessing. So the closer you move to unity, the more unity you create, the more harmony you create, you're activating the blessing of God that he commands. Pretty cool stuff. Plus, as my grandfather with a fourth grade education used to say, better to have the good will of a dog than the bad will. So you got these weaker brothers that are failing in many different ways. Better to have their good will than their bad will. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That word welcome, it means you make them feel well as they come to you. Well, come. Come and be well. It means to receive. It means to accept. It even means to reach out and take them by the hand and lead them in the right directions. He say, welcome them as God welcome you. One of the differences between Jesus and churches, not all churches, but a lot of churches, a lot of churches say, hey, you know, if you clean up your act just a little bit, you can come and join us. Jesus said, come and join me. We'll clean up your act. As we go. The big difference. It's easier said than done. But he took us exactly as we were. 2,000 years ago. While we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Before we were ever born. He provided everything we would ever possibly need. That's how he welcomes us. That's how he accepts us. That's how he brings us into his family and moves into the right direction. That's what he's talking about. Bond with them. Become their friends. He had those ragtag disciples. He became their best friend, best friend they'd ever had. He spent three years of his life living with them, constantly bearing with them, constantly building them up constantly bonding with them. And they failed him royally when he was crucified. They abandoned him totally and completely. He continued to love them and to build them up and to bear with them. He was constantly loving them, teaching them to become mature adults. I'm really surprised that some of the people who have known me all of my life, and some of them are still alive, I'm surprised they didn't speak to me. I did some bonehead things when I was a kid mischievous, not morally really bad, but just mischievous, constantly getting into stuff all the time. But I finally grew up. I look at the people, I, I was a youth minister for 10 years. Some of those kids that gave all of the adults the most trouble have turned into be preachers, ministers, attorneys, Physicians, scientists, movie stars, rock stars. It's worth the investment. It brings purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction to your lives when you obey God by bearing with them, building them up, bonding with them, helping them live better lives. It's very rewarding and fulfilling, but it may take you decades to see the results. Go for it. I'll wrap it up with this. There was a man driving his old Pontiac way back before the days of AAA and cell phones. And he was driving through the country roads, not anybody else in sight, just driving along the road. He topped a hill and he saw in front of him, it looked like a brand new Mercedes. It was a big one. It was shiny. It was clean as he got closer to it. He noticed one of the tires was just as flat as it could be. And there was this little old lady standing up, just kind of staring at that flat tire. She didn't know what to do. She'd been there for hours. Nobody had stopped to help her. He drives by. He slows down. He looks at her, looks at the car, pulls over on the side of the road. And when he pulls over on the side of the road, he gets out of his car. He's got to walk back, you know, a distance, 20, 30, 40 feet. 
he sees this lady, lady's looking kind of scared because he was a big guy and he was poor and he was kind of sloppy and disheveled and just looked like a dangerous person. So he didn't want her to be afraid. As he's walking up, he smiled real big. He smiled real big at her. And as he smiled real big at her, he said, hey, I'm here to help you if you'd like me to change that tire for you. I'll do it. My name is Brian Anderson. He introduced himself, gave her a name, trying to make her be comfortable. And she was lost. She had no idea that there might be a spare tire in the trunk. It looked like a brand new car to him. He said, ma'am, do you have a spare? She says, I, a spare what? <laughs> she just didn't know. He said, if we look in your trunk, we'll probably find a spare tire and the tools we need to change it. And I can change it and get you going again. You go to town, you get this tire fixed. She said, okay. So they opened the trunk and lo and behold, there was a spare tire. It had never been used. Brand new, full of air. There was a jack. There was a tire tool. Well, he had to slide under the car. When she pulled over on the side of the road, she didn't park in the best way possible. It was difficult. But he got under there, he got the jack set, he jacked it up, he took the old tire off, put the new tire on, got her all taken care of. And when he was done, he said, thank you so much for letting me help. And she said, how much do I owe you? He said, oh, ma'am, you don't owe me anything. She was like, I, can I pay you something? He said, if you want to pay me, when you run across somebody that needs help and you have the ability to help them with their need, would you just help them and think about me? And she said, well, okay. Well, he got in his car and drove off. She got in her car, drove down the road. She'd been out there for a while. She was hungry. Lunchtime had already passed. She found a little cafe. She went in. There was a small petite waitress who was about eight months pregnant there, looked like she was about to pop. And she was wiping her face and her hair with a towel because she had been so sweaty working in that hot little restaurant all breakfast and lunch. And obviously tired and worn out, but she was friendly. She smiled. She talked to this lady. She brought her some food. When the lady finished her meal and the lady brought the waitress brought her the check, she laid down a hundred dollar bill to pay for her dinner. Little girl took it off, said, I'll be right back. I gotta go to the back to get some change for this. She took the hundred dollar bill, the check, she went and got it. She came back, the lady was gone. No sign of her. The big shiny Mercedes was gone. The woman was gone. She left a note on the napkin. She said, you don't owe me anything, but I've been in difficult times myself. And I just wanted to do something to help. And you don't owe me anything, but please don't let this string of love end here. When you find somebody that needs help, help them as best you can. And when the lady picked up the napkin, there were four more hundred dollar bills there. She was so excited, eight months pregnant, working as a waitress. She goes home. She can't wait till her tell her husband because she knows he's really been worried about finances. When she has this baby, she can't work as a waitress anymore. They're really going to be tight for money. And now she's got nearly $500 that they didn't see coming. She's so excited. She gets home. She tells her husband the story. He's excited, takes a huge load off of him. She's got one hand on her great big extended belly, wraps the other round around him, leans over, says everything's going to be just fine now. Looks up at him, gives him a kiss, whispers in his ear, I love you, Brian Anderson. You never know how things are going to come back. But God promises us we reap what we sow. He knows what he's talking about. Even when it's inconvenient, even when it's uncomfortable, we can bear with the failings of the weak. We can build them up and we can bond with them. It's his way. His way always works.